built some powerful N8N &N workflows that save hours and scale businesses. But when it comes time to pitch them, your proposal seems really solid. Then it gets ghosted. In this video, I'm gonna show you guys a simple proposal strategy that will get your clients to say yes before the meeting is over. So let's go ahead and jump right in. There is no one size fits all for proposals. Different types of clients have different types of needs and therefore need different types of proposals. In this video, I'm going to cover all of that, so don't you guys worry. And I'm gonna show you exactly how I would turn in these proposals based on the different type of clients we would have. Guys, please be sure to stay until the end of the video because I have some really good tips and tricks that'll help you guys increase your closing percentage and land more sales. I believe that there are three main types of clients. This first type of client is by far the easiest to close and you don't need a really crazy proposal. In fact, you don't really need a proposal at all in order to close them. Now these are clients that want something done either very quickly, pretty cheap, or the project is just relatively small. These types of clients you can usually sell on the first phone call via email or via text. Sometimes you don't even have to talk to them. When it comes time to send over the proposal, all you have to do is have a small summary of what you guys talked about with a link to a simple contract and a link to pay based on your guys' payment terms. Here's a sample of an email that you might send. Hey friend, here's the updated contract and invoice. As we discussed, the project cost is $3,000 with 75% upfront. The development timeline is 7 to 10 days and we provide a 30 day warranty on the software to ensure everything runs smoothly. We'll also be featuring this workflow on our YouTube channel. This will not include any confidential information. I sent the contract over with the attached SOW or scope of work separately. If you want to move forward, here's a link to the first invoice. If you have any questions or need any clarifications, feel free to reach out. Looking forward to working together. And so the client provided a scope of work document in this example, and it's always good to have one. So this is kind of what it looks like. First, you have your project overview, which talks kind of generally about what you're trying to accomplish, maybe has some supporting links to it. Then you talk about the different workflows that you need and the functionalities that needs. And then we've got the deliverables and the technical requirements. So basically what tech stack are you using? Then you have the timeline here. Now this the client sent over to us, so we didn't fill it out. And then you've got your budget and payment terms, which you might include in this document or you might include in the contract itself. Honestly, this is very close to what a contract looks like. So you might not even need a scope of work. You might just want to send over a contract. And then this down here is just stuff that the client included. You don't really need it. The scope of work document is basically everything up to timeline and above. Everything below this is not part of a scope of work document. Now a scope of work document and a contract can essentially be the same thing. They can all be kind of meshed into one. Now these contracts are going to look a little bit different depending on what your agreement is, but I'm going to show you guys a pretty simple contract that I have right here as a template for simple scraping projects. Okay. So we've got the first section that just defines who the contract is between. So it was made on this day. It's between you and me, the company, right? And we start talking about the services provided. Now this is where you would list out your, oh, you know, we're doing N8N or we're doing scraping or XYZ thing. Then we talk about the deliverability. That's in section two. It doesn't need to be called deployment and access. It can be called whatever you want. But this section talks about like what the client will actually receive. Now, this might be a workflow.json file in the N8N could be multiple different things. Then we do a quick talk about the payment terms, whatever it is you discussed with the client. Next, we have the responsibilities of the client, what the client is required to give to you in order for you to complete this contract. We talk a little bit about intellectual property. That's a big thing in software. Generally speaking, most of the software you're going to give away, you should license out to people. Exclusive software rights cost a lot more and it gives you the option to reuse those workflows later with other clients so long as they don't contain confidential information. Then you have your warranty and support, your relationship, and your confidentiality section. Now this confidentiality section is really small. It's not like an NDA and NDAs are much larger and oftentimes you'll send those separate. So you'll send an NDA and you'll send over the contract just so you guys know. We'll say where it's governed at, and then at the end we've got our entire agreement and notices. 
right? So when you take these contracts here, the only thing you're really going to change is everything from here and above, okay? Anything below this point right here, you're not going to be changing. Since we're on the subject of contracts, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. This is a simple template that I got off of a lawyer from Fiverr. I know a lot of them are using ChatGPT to generate contracts, and it's pretty good for simple projects under $10,000. That being said, if you are going to do a project that costs more than, say, $25,000, $30,000, it is highly recommended that you get a contract specific for that project. Getting a lawyer to custom draft a contract for you will cost anywhere between $75 to $200, but the amount of money that you might save in case something goes wrong is invaluable, and it's highly recommended that you guys do that. Disclaimer, I'm not a legal professional and I'm not giving out legal advice. Okay, your second type of client is somebody who most likely as a more established business or they're a little bit on the fence or the project size is a little bit bigger the cost is a little bit more or it's just something very important to the person who's buying when you come across these types of clients they need a little bit more assurance just sending over a simple contract with a scope of work attached to it is not enough and that's where the development deck comes in I used to think that development decks were stupid. To me, it reminds me of those really crappy PowerPoint presentations that we used to do in high school in front of the whole class. Who wants to see a crappy PowerPoint? But I was completely wrong. You see, the development deck serves a couple of very important purposes. Its primary purpose is to identify and kill pain points and objections while you're still on the call. Its secondary purpose is to represent you when you're not on a call. A lot of times when you're selling these companies, there's conversations happening offline that you're not aware of. Business partner might be asking his team or somebody else for advice, wondering if it's a good service that he's about to buy. And oftentimes when the business owner does that, they will misrepresent you or your service in some way. Either they might not mention a pain point that the other person might have, or they might forget to mention something here or there. Regardless, it is in your best interest as a business and as a freelancer to put your best foot forward always when you're being represented. And the way to do that is to leave a development deck behind because when that person then goes to talk to whoever it is they're going to talk to, they're gonna have something to show them that talks the way that you wanna talk, that shows them what you wanna show them. The last major purpose of a development deck is to get your visual and kinesthetic people on board with what you're saying. You see, there are three main types of people. You have auditory people, visual people, and kinesthetic people. Auditory people learn and communicate mostly based on what they hear. Visual people will learn and communicate based on what they see, and kinesthetic people will communicate based on how they feel. By having a development deck, you're covering all the visual spectrum, which will cover the visual people, giving them something to look at while you're talking. And the imagery that you use in the development deck can evoke certain emotions, which also cover the kinesthetic people. Now there's a very specific psychology that I use for my development decks. I break them down into different sections. So I'm gonna show you a development deck right now that I built. This is a template deck that I use. I often will add or remove slides tweak them and switch them out based on who I'm talking to, but the formula is the same regardless of the service that I'm trying to sell. Here we have a title page. Now there's nothing super special about this page. The only thing you need to understand is you should be using your brand colors, your brand fonts, and all your brand guidelines. Unless you're going overboard and making a branded dev deck for the company you're reaching out to, in which case you would use their logos, their colors, and their fonts. The second slide will tell them a bit about what you do in less than a paragraph. After that, the next following few slides are based around identifying pain points and how you solve them and identifying objections and getting rid of them. Of course, none of this really matters. It doesn't really matter what the text is 
on the screen, just keep in mind, you're taking a pain point like, oh, the client is losing a lot of time doing X, Y, Z thing, and you're saying, hey, we solved where you don't have to spend any time doing those things. So you're solving for a pain point. Same thing with objections. If the client thinks it's expensive, show them how much money that they're losing because they're not buying your service. These next couple of slides are the same thing. We're just identifying pain points and smashing objections. Here on this slide, we're starting to educate the client as to why we're different, what sets us apart from other people. And in order to do that, we give a bold statement of why the other people are inadequate. And then we start talking about the process that we have that's different from other development companies. This is more slides about the process that we do. Still some more slides about the process we do. And then we start talking about our certifications. Now, why are we qualified to do this? Then we have to make it personable because ultimately they're dealing with people, people like people. So we show them the team that is working with us. Then we start to show some case studies studies. Why? Well, because they need social proof. And so that's where the case studies come in. We have several case studies here. And then at the end, we give them some way to contact us. Now, if you're sending this over in a proposal, you might want to add one or two slides right at the end talking about what the project is and how much it's going to cost. But you want to keep it pretty minimal because again, this is like a medium range client. They're not paying a lot of money, but they're not super cheap. So you want to put in a little bit of work, but you don't want to put in a lot of time on the proposal process because they may or may not buy and it wouldn't be worth it if you put in a lot of time. So all you have to do is combine this with the other thing I showed you for the first type of client, send that over as a package deal, and you've covered your client number two. Now the final type of client is a client who either has a very big project or multiple people are involved, or they're just really on the fence or slightly controlling and want to know how things get done. And for these guys, you need what we included with the first client, what we included with the second client, and we have to add an additional project plan to the proposal for them to feel comfortable moving forward. Project planning takes a lot of time to do and generally only starts after somebody's bought the product. So be sure you only do this type of proposal if the client is really, really worth it. The cool thing about adding this to your proposal is that if you include the client with the planning process, it will help you sell them down the line. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, by hopping on some calls with them and actually planning things with them on the call, they become emotionally invested in the project even though they haven't bought yet. Because of that emotional investment, they will be more likely to buy due to something called the sunk cost fallacy. Which basically means that they already spent a bunch of time working on this project, so they want to make sure it works because Otherwise, all that time gets wasted. Here is an example of a project plan that I made. I did this using Notion. That's all you really need. Don't need anything more fancy than that. And all it does is talk about the project and we break it down into nice little milestones. Each milestone has its own information about it, has its own description about what the task should do, how the agents should work, any improvements that we think we could add to that process, an estimated timeline of how long we think it will take, a price, and the deliverables for that milestone. Now, these are for very big projects, right? So there's going to be multiple milestones. You don't want to plan too far ahead. And especially with projects that are 50,000 plus, Sometimes you'll only plan out the first three or four milestones really well, and then the rest of the milestones you'll just give general ballparks. As you can see, each of these milestones essentially have the same things involved with them, and this can change based on your company and what you do and lots of things. This does not have to look like what I'm showing you here. There's no real format to it. It's just a plan of like, these are the tech we're going to use, here's how long we think it's going to take. Sometimes we'll even include these are the people that we're going to put in place. This part's going to take this long from this team. This team over here is going to do this and it's going to take that long, right? So just a good, well-documented project plan that you might give to a project manager in order to get the project done. At the beginning of this video, I promised you guys I would give a quick tip on how to increase your closing rate. 
So my quick tip is the following. Go ahead and send out the contract out up front if you're worried about the close and have them sign the contract and let them know that you'll get started working and that they could get the payment taken care of the next Monday or something like that. Of course, you're not actually going to start the work, but they don't know that. By having them sign the contract first, subconsciously they're agreeing to pay the amount without actually seeing the dollar amount in front of them, which removes the friction. So then when they actually go to pay the thing, they've already signed the contract and they feel obligated to pay it. This will increase your closing rate quite a bit, but I only save that for clients that are really on the fence. If this video helped you guys out, then you have to watch my other video on AI generated sales funnels. So be sure to check that out and you guys have a wonderful day.